So my name is Paul Gross. I'm a developer at Braintree. So Braintree uh, is a startup, essentially, and I've been there about four years. And so you know, in the early days, we had a very small team. And so even though I'm a, uh, you know, more of a software developer, we all kind of did everything for a long time. So I did a lot of the systems work as well. Um, but if you have any questions that are you know, essentially too low level for me, we have a lot of system guys here as well from Braintree. So we can definitely answer pretty much any question. But just a warning that I'm more of a developer. So, you know, for those that don't know, Braintree is a payment gateway, and what that means is it's essentially software to process credit cards from an application or, you know, a website, something like that. So these are some of our merchants. So the idea with Braintree is you go to github.com, you sign up, you want to pay, you enter your card details, you hit submit, they send the card details to us, and we do all of the payments related to work. So we'll, you know, determine whether the card is valid, we'll run it, we'll move the funds at the end of the night, we will store the card later and give you back a token so you can run future purchases without storing credit card details. Just kind of basically all of the payments related stuff. So, you know, the question, why is uptime important to us? At our current estimates, we do about $10 billion in processing a year, which comes out to be about $19,000 a minute. So uptime is extremely important for us because it's extremely costly. So when we're down for even shorter amounts of time, you know, obviously we lose money because we make money on every credit card transaction. But I think more importantly, you know, you may not have known that a lot of those merchants used us to process payments. We're kind of a silent partner. You know, we're not really like PayPal where you have to go to PayPal to check out. Like, merchants integrate with us and they control the flow. And so when we're down, you may go to check out at some of, you know, one of our merchants' websites and you get an error or you get a spinner that just doesn't come back. So even more than the money we lose, it's, you know, we look really bad to our merchants and we make our merchants look bad to their customers when we're down. So we care you know, very deeply about uptime and just making sure that you know, we're making money and our merchants look good and our merchants are making money. So I like to include this. You know, people talk about uptime and how many nines of uptime, um, but not everyone really talks about what the actual numbers are. So you hear, you, know, you hear five nines kind of thrown out as the target. Five nines is extremely difficult, right? It's five minutes of downtime a year. So if your primary database crashes and you need to manually bring it back up, or you know, something happens in the middle of the night and it requires some person to intervene, you know, and it takes 10 minutes to bring it up or something like that, you've blown five nines for the whole year. So I mean, that's 26 seconds a month. It's, it's almost nothing. So I would say you know, we strive for five nines. We're probably a little bit closer to four nines. Um, but for some of the stuff I'll talk about later, our, our uptime is actually really hard to measure. Because we, because we take the credit cards and then we send them off to processing networks and banks and stuff, you know, even though we may be up, there may be issues for us connecting out, and other, other networks may be down. So our uptime is extremely hard to manage, but it's between four and five nines, essentially. So in this talk, I'm going to cover kind of three causes of downtime as I see them. There's planned maintenance, there's unplanned failure, and then there's just people making mistakes, essentially. So planned maintenance, you know, this is kind of the idea that we know we need to do something to our site, um, and we're going to take a maintenance window to do it. So you know, we're actively working on the site, and we know we're going to have out it. We're, we're going to have an outage for this. So for us, the biggest you know maintenance window is a code deploy. We're going to you know we're a quick moving company. We're constantly iterating. We're constantly releasing new things. We want to push that out, and we know that that is a maintenance window. So uh, Braintree is primarily a Ruby on Rails app. It started about four years ago, and at the time, it looked pretty similar to Ruby on Rails apps from four years ago. It ran it ran on MySQL. It used Apache and Passenger, and it was just kind of like a big, you know, just kind of a big monolithic app running behind Apache, essentially. Um, so the way we would do these deploys, historically, is we'd put up the maintenance page. We would then push out the new code to all of our servers. We'd run any database migrations we have, so we're constantly iterating, new, adding new tables, new columns. We'd run all that stuff, and then we'd take down the maintenance page. So between those two maintenance pages, we're essentially down. You know, we can't, you know, that, this, is, this is the way you kind of deployed Ruby on Rails apps four years ago, and the way we certainly did. So, you know, in that window right there, pushing out the code is pretty fast. It's not a big deal. Database migrations can actually be pretty slow. And so that was the first thing we kind of attacked. So the first, you know, one of the big things we did back in the day was we moved from MySQL to Postgres. So, you know, DDL migrations are extremely fast on Postgres and very slow on MySQL. So I don't know how much of this is still true. I haven't used MySQL in a long time, but... At least back then, in order to add a column to a table in MySQL, it would actually copy the entire table again. Um, in order to add an index, it would lock the whole table. And so as your data grows and it gets bigger and bigger, the time to add columns goes up dramatically. Or, you know, if you want to rename a column, same thing, it locks the whole thing. 
And so we got to the point where our deploys were taking noticeable amount of downtime because they were just adding columns, let's say, to a table. Postgres, on the other hand, is extremely fast. It's millisecond operations to do those things. Postgres also lets us add indexes without locking. So MySQL, when you add an index, it would lock the table. You couldn't write to it. It's essentially an outage, at least for some functionality. Postgres adds a keyword concurrently, so you can add indexes concurrently while the site's up. It adds a little bit of extra CPU overhead to the database, but it's largely unnoticed. <laughs> and then the other big thing that Postgres gives us is transactional DDL. So those familiar with Rails know about database migrations. You basically package up all of your database statements into a file, and then you, when you run the new code, you run all the statements in that file. So if there are 10 statements in that file and the fifth one fails, you know, with MySQL, you're in a bad state. Right? You either have to manually finish the migration or you have to manually unroll it to try to get back to a state where you can put either the new code or the old code. You know, chances are your code may not run with in, in the intermediate state. So with Postgres, we, wrap, we can wrap all that stuff in a transaction. And basically, if the deploy fails, we roll the whole thing back and just put back the old code. And then we go fix you know, the migration or what happened with it. So we're not, we, we don't leave the database in a messed up state. So I did a, you know, a whole separate presentation on just this switch. If you're interested in more details, you can check out my slides. OK, so we switched to Postgres. We kind of redefined our deploy process to reduce our downtime. And this is what it looks like now. So now, while the site's up, while it's running the old version of the code, we'll add new tables and columns. So we go through, like again, these are super fast operations. They have no noticeable impact on the site. We just add all the new stuff that we need. And then we roll the code out server by server. So we changed our deploy process now to you know, each app server at a time, we put out the new code and restart it. So one at a time, no downtime there. And then once we're done, we're fully on the new stuff, we just add all the indexes that we wanted to add. And we do these all concurrently, and the site stays up as well. And so this is, this is no, you know, no downtime here. So this is the way it looks. Um, for those familiar with Rails, Rails gives you a DB migrate task. So what we added was we added a migrate pre and a migrate post. And essentially, we use the same Rails code, the active record migrator, and we just point it at two different folders. So now you write the same Rails migrations you used to, but if you put them in a migrate pre folder, they'll run at the beginning while the site's still up. And then if you put them in a migrate post, they'll run at the end after the new code has been deployed. So it's just kind of how we, you know, we leverage the existing Rails stuff and kind of add on to it. So there's one problem with this, which is that Rails caches database columns. So when Rails starts up, it interrogates the database and caches all the columns for your tables so that it doesn't have to go interrogate them later. So the problem with this is that you know, you, if, if the site starts up and it's got a set of columns, you know, it, it doesn't know about anything you don't want. So if you are trying to drop a column, let's say, you, know, you have a problem, which is that even if, you, even if the code is no longer using the column, um, if you drop the column, the database statements that Rails is writing to the database, Active Record is writing, includes that column, even if there's no value in it. And so then your insert statements or your update statements will just start failing. So it, it doesn't let you drop a column essentially. So what we wanted was basically a way to tell Rails to, to forget the column, right? just to tell Rails that don't worry about this column anymore so we can actually drop it since the app code is no longer using it. So we built that. It looks like this. So on a model, you basically, you basically list out all the columns you want deleted with a method called deleted columns. Um, and the way that looks is it looks like this. So I, I apologize if you don't know Ruby. This, it's a little convoluted, but basically, we open up Active Record Base, so we get this on all of our Active Record Base models, which are the models that correspond to the database tables. And we add a method called deleted columns, which basically just stores the list you give it in an instance variable called deleted columns. And then we do this thing called alias method chain that's pretty popular in Rails. It basically replaces an existing method with a new method. So in our case, we replace the existing method columns with a new method that just calls the old method and then removes the ones you told it to remove. So now, anything that calls active record based columns, which is all the Rails code, any code that we write that uses it, will basically only get back the set of columns that the database has minus the ones we told it to forget. And this allows us now, in post migrations, we can actually just drop columns once we're no longer using them. So essentially what we do, and we usually don't drop them right away because we want the ability to roll back. And if you roll back and you don't have the column, you, know, you have a problem. So generally what we do is when we, when we are no longer using a column, we'll add it to the list of deleted columns for the next release, we'll let that go out, and then the release after that, we'll drop the column. And that way, we still preserve the ability to roll back one release. And this is, this is basically how we do column deletes today. So something I glossed over a little bit that's uh, pretty interesting, we actually run multiple versions of the code at once. 
So while we're deploying server by server, you know, app server at a time, you know, we're running the old version on some app servers and the new version on other app servers. Um, it turns out this is usually fine. It doesn't really have that many problems. Uh, for new features, you know, maybe they won't appear fully until the whole thing's rolled out. Um, most things are additive in general. You know, um, things that we change also usually it's okay. Maybe you'll have a little bit of old behavior, new behavior for a, a few minutes. It's not usually a big deal. Um, for the things that it is a big deal, we use feature switches pretty extensively. So we have this idea, we have both merchant level feature switches and kind of global ones. So if we're rolling out something that's big and new and we don't want it to be partially on, we'll roll it out dark with the feature switch turned off. Once we're fully on the new version of the code, then we'll turn it on and we can turn it on just for one merchant, let's say. You know, we'll work with a merchant, we'll find some beta merchants for a new feature. We'll turn it on just for them, we'll watch it, we'll see how it works, and then we can turn it on across the board. If it's not a merchant specific thing, we also have a way just to turn on global switches. And that way, if something goes wrong, we can immediately turn it off. We don't have to roll back or anything like that. Um, and then once you know, the feature is fully on in production, we're not gonna turn it off. It's just part of our app now. Then we'll go back and remove the feature switches just so we don't have a ton of them kind of hanging around. And so this is, I mean, this is what we do today for most of our deploys. We roll out most large features dark, and then we turn them on slowly, essentially. So like I said, this is how we do almost all of our deploys today, probably 95%. We do the server by server with the pre-migrations and the post-migrations. Um, and it works really well for most cases. Uh, there are a few limitations, though. So column renames are one. So I, to, you know, I talked about how you can add columns in a pre-migration. You can drop columns now in a post-migration. But you really can't rename columns, right? It's very, it's very difficult to have the app running and handle a column rename because it means the app has to know about both the old and the new name and kind of figure out which one's currently the right one. And so generally, we just don't do these with these kind of deploys. We also have things like you know, database failover. So what I've kind of talked about is really good for rolling out new code. But what if we need to do another kind of maintenance, like a controlled database failover? You know, we want to do some work on our primary database. You know, nothing I've really talked about handles that case. That it would just be a downtime operation. Or just similarly, other infrastructure changes. Right? There's a whole set of things we want to do to our environment. Um, nothing I've really talked about kind of handles that. And so what we wanted was something more, essentially. We wanted a way to pause traffic. And once we can pause traffic, we can do whatever we need to do and not impact our merchants connecting to us. So this is you know, a simplified version of what our architecture looks like. Our traffic comes in through a load balancer. It gets balanced over N, Apache, N Apaches. I've drawn two here. And then it goes to something called the proxy, which I'll go into detail. The proxy feeds into a queue based on Redis. So we use a Redis ephemeral queue. And then we have the dispatchers, which also cover kind of feeding out of that Redis. So the, the important piece here is that we now inserted a queue in the middle of our architecture. So the proxy is the Braintree proxy, not a very clever name, unfortunately. Um, it's a Python tornado app. And we basically you know, kind of looked around at the state, and this is a few years old already. And we looked and we wanted something that was extremely efficient at just kind of shoveling around network traffic. And so we kind of looked around and we liked the idea of something evented, right? It's, it's holding tons of open connections from Apache. It's holding tons of open connections to Redis. We wanted just something really efficient. We, and we just felt like Python Tornado was very stable, very good evented. It has built-in facilities for testing and things like that. So we really liked it. So the proxy accepts web requests from Apache. It then feeds them into the Redis queue. And then it reads the responses out of the Redis queue from downstream. And then it responds back to the web request. So it's the top half of the stack just feeding into Redis and then responding. And so it looks like this. Uh, so Python, Tornado, for people that know Python or Tornado, we basically define a Tornado application, and that first line is the route, essentially. So we say every, every route, right, dot star, every request goes to the same handler, call it request handler. And then it looks like this. You basically mark the method as a Tornado asynchronous method, and Tornado kind of handles the magic. And then all it does is it basically builds a request ID out of a UUID, and this is so we can track the request downstream. So that every request has the same request ID all the way through. And then we build a payload, which is just a JSON body of everything we got in the web request. Um, so it has the headers, the URI, the path, it has the body, and then including the request ID. So we build this kind of JSON blob of everything we need. And then we just push it into a Redis queue. And then we also just keep, it, we keep track in an internal dictionary of this request handler object. And we need the actual handler because in order to respond, we need to know which connection we're responding to. So basically, it just enqueues the giant JSON body and then records based on the request ID, what the actual instance of the handler is. And then on the way back, it, it does a blocking left pop, a BL pop on Redis. So what this means is that it 
So a blocking left pop in Redis will not return until an item is there or it times out. So basically, we do a blocking pop, and it just sits there and waits. And as soon as something appears in the response, we grab it, and we call handle response, which then loads it back out of JSON coming from downstream. We grab the request ID off of that that you know, we need. And then we go look up that handler again, the, thing, the same thing that we store in the internal dictionary. And then now that we have the handler, we can just respond back out to Apache. So we write the status, the body, and then we call finish. And so this is pretty much, I mean, this is obviously simplified code, but basically it's all it's doing. It's shoveling into Redis and then reading the responses and shoveling it back. And it's doing it very efficiently. And then at the end, we just schedule another blocking pop. So this is just how our loop goes. We just keep, keep reading off the responses. So that's the top half before the Redis queue. The bottom half are these dispatchers. So these are rack adapters. So for those that don't know rack, rack is like a Ruby it's kind of like a Ruby web service framework. Um, most of the you know, Ruby web service web apps now are kind of based on Rack, like Rails and Sinatra and all those. And it's basically a common interface that they all adhere to so that you can integrate with any kind of Rack app essentially with the same code. So what this thing does is, so it's a Rack app. It takes the requests from Redis that the proxy is pushing in and then processes them through Rails using the Rack adapter. So you know, we still, even though we split this up and use a queue, we're still using Rails. We're st we've still kept the core of our application in Rails, and we're just using this rack adapter. And then once we get the response from Rails, we put it back in Redis to go back up the stack. So that, that code looks like this. So basically, it's a script, um, again, simplified. But we basically load the Rails config environment. And so once you do this, at this point, Rails is loaded, right? Our script is, has all of Rails loaded. And then we create a rack app from the action controller code. So we're basically making our own Rack app, but we're using all of the same routing and all the same code from Rails, the action controller stuff. And then in a big loop, we just pull the request off of Redis. We build the Rack request, which you know, has a very specific format. It's a giant hash. I've shown two keys here, but there's actually a ton of keys. So we build this giant hash, and then we say app.call, which basically goes through all of the normal Rails code. So normally, you know, Rails is running as a web server. It gets web requests. So we're using all that same code, but instead of passing a web request, we just call it with a hash that it uses internally. And then once we get back the response, we just build up the body, uh, build it up back to what it was, and then just push it back onto Redis, the status, the body, there's you know, headers, things like that. All that stuff goes back out. So this is what it looks like again. So now that we've put a Redis kind of in the middle of our architecture, in order to suspend traffic, all we have to do is stop the dispatchers. So once we stop these dispatchers, the top half of the stack is still working, right? Requests keep coming in. The proxy keeps pushing them into Redis. There's just nothing processing them. So at this point, you know, we have no app running. We can do anything we want. We can do database failover. We can um, upgrade servers. We can do, you know, we use this to actually fail over between data centers. And the requests are just stacking up in Redis, right? They're just queuing up. And then when we're done with whatever we need to do, rolling out new code, column renames, anything, we basically just start up the dispatchers again, and then they will go through the queue and process it, and they'll process them all pretty quickly. So the, you know, the merchants calling us will see longer requests, but they won't actually get failures. So when you click the checkout button, instead of getting a response in two seconds, maybe it'll take 15 seconds, which is still you know, a lot better than just not getting a response or getting the wrong response. So this is, this is how we kind of handle the cases where we can't do the normal server server deploy. It's, it's, it's the, you know, the hammer approach. Like Once you stop the app, you can do whatever you want, as long as we do it very quickly. And we generally try to keep these operations under 30 seconds um, so that requests don't time out. We have, we have the advantage that we, we release client libraries that people integrate with. So if you're going to process payments, you generally use our client libraries. And so we control the timeouts, and we can kind of make sure they all align. So we know how much time we have before our clients start timing out. Uh, and that's generally a minute. So we try to keep our operations under 30 seconds. That way, things have time to spin back up and clear out the queue before anything times out. So yeah, so that's pretty much how we do deploys now. Summarize, we do pre and post migration. So we try to do as much as we can while the site's up. So pre migrations for adding new stuff, post migrations for dropping old stuff and adding indexes. We do rolling deploys for 95% of our deploys or so. Um, where we just do server by server, you know, the lowest risk. We don't actually take the whole site down at any given time. Um, we use Postgres to just get really fast database operations. And then for everything that that doesn't cover, we use the proxy to pause traffic. Cool. So that's kind of the, that's, that's the planned section. 
So now we've got unplanned failures, right? As everyone knows here, I'm sure, servers fail, networks fail. Um, in general, the unexpected happens. You can't really plan for everything. So we basically do our best to try to build resilient systems to try to, to, try to handle known failures, but also uh, hopefully unknown failures as well. So the first thing is server failure. Um, servers obviously fail all the time. Uh, we do load balancing, which is, I'm sure, no surprise. We build our own load balancers, though, which may be a surprise. Um, so we, at Braintree, we generally prefer kind of understandable components and, and components that we can tweak and really, really build out to what we need. And so we tend not to buy kind of black boxes. So, you know, load balancing appliances or a black box are very expensive. Um, we tend to just kind of build our own so that we understand all the components and can change them to suit our needs. So we use LVS or IPVS, the Linux Virtual Server Project or IP Virtual Server, which is kernel level routing. So we have uh, Linux servers running LVS, and the kernel just shovels packets around to different backends based on how our load balancing rules are. And then we manage our cluster of load balancers with Pacemaker. So we run uh, you know, three load balancers per data center. Uh, Pacemaker handles failover. So if the, if the load balancer itself fails, everything will fail over to a different load balancer. And then we use two components that we wrote, Big Brother and Limits Paper, and I'll cover these. So here's you know, kind of the, the diagram. So traffic comes in from the internet, or even internally, we do a lot of internal load balancing. Um, it goes to a virtual IP that lives on one of our load balancers. So each load balancer has many virtual IPs for different services. Um, and then from there, the load balancer is shoveling the traffic to backend servers. Here I've shown Apache. And so the thing to note here is that Big Brother runs on the load balancer, and Litmus Paper runs on the backend. And those are the two pieces that kind of control our load balancing. So Big Brother is a Ruby app we wrote. He said it runs on the load balancers. Its job is just to check the status of the backend servers. So you know, every second, it's just constantly pulling, like, are you up, are you up, are you up? And then it updates the IPVS rules on the server. So based on what it discovers, it changes the kernel-level routing. And then the kernel-level routing is just, you know, the kernel's just moving packets. So if Big Brother were to die, let's say, all the routing would still happen, and Big Brother would just come up, and then when it's up, it just changes rules. So it's not, you know, we don't even need Big Brother to be highly available. It can go down for periods of time because the Linux kernel is actually doing the routing itself. And Big Brother is open source. You can check it out on our GitHub. So Litmus Paper is the other side of the equation. It's also a Ruby app. Um, we tend to write a lot of Ruby apps just because we do mostly Ruby, and so it's something we're very familiar with. Um, it also it runs on the backend servers now. This is the other side of the piece. And its job is to be queried by Big Brother you know, every second. And it basically returns a health bubble. So Litmus Paper is a standard interface for Big Brother to query. So it's, you know, it gives an HTTP interface, and then it turns around and figures out how the box is doing. So if it's like an Apache box, Limits Paper will probably just turn around and curl another route. So if the route's up, then Limits Paper is up. Um, and then it kind of mixes that with you know, things about the box, like the load average or things like that. So if the Apache's up, but the load's really high, maybe the health goes down, things like that. And this is also on, on uh, GitHub. So Limits Paper, so Big Brother is querying Limits Paper. It looks like this. So Big Brother's constantly changing routing rules. Limits Paper just gives it a standard interface to query. And then this is kind of how we do all of our load balancing. And it works, it works really well. We've been using it for years now. So that, that works great for stateless services, right, where you have multiple backends and you're sending traffic to all of them. It doesn't work as well for stateful services. So in our case, stateful services are things like the load balancers themselves, right? They hold virtual IPs, and only one of them holds the IP. Our Postgres clusters, we use you know, Postgres for all of our, almost all of our data now. Postgres has the idea of primaries and secondaries. You can't, you can't send writes to an async slave, you need to send them to the master. So you need the idea of this is the master and these are the slaves, not these are all balanced in. And so for these, we use Pacemaker. I already mentioned it with the load balancers. But basically, we use Pacemaker for anything that's stateless. Pacemaker manages the whole cluster. With Postgres, it'll do promotions, and it'll do you know, rearranging the slaves to make sure that the old ones follow the new ones and all that stuff. And then we just move, and Pacemaker will also move the virtual IP. So all of our apps, both externally and internally, are pinned to virtual IPs. And then Pacemaker moves those virtual IPs. So if the database crashes and then it brings up a new one, the app doesn't have to change any configuration. It just keeps going at the same IP because the IP will move. OK, so that's, that's kind of server failure. So now network failure. So a couple of fun pictures, uh, some sites I like to look at, outages.org. Um, this just shows you kind of ISP outages around the country. I think this is a six-month period. 
Um, you can basically see where the outages are by seeing where the data centers are. You can see there's like a big data center in Chicago that obviously had some problems on the East Coast. Um, so that's a fun one. This one we use a lot too, Internet Pulse. So this one actually breaks it down by ISP. So you can see at the top, like AT&T was having trouble connecting to Savas at the time I took this picture. Um, at the bottom, you can see Verizon's having trouble connecting to both CenturyLink and Cogent. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of these pictures and the, and the stuff I've learned at Braintree is that, you know, the ISPs have issues, right? You kind of think of them as being always up, or at least maybe I used to, but they actually have lots of problems, and the problems are generally between different ISPs. Like here, Verizon's not having a total outage. They're only having an outage connecting to certain other ISPs. So this is basically what we have to handle. So I'm going to split the networking up into inbound and outbound. So inbound is merchants connecting to us, right? Like they have a website or a web application, an API coming to us. So they're making a request to us. So for this, we use BGP. So BGP is Border Gateway Protocol. It's essentially the protocol of the internet. Um, we basically have one network block that we can broadcast across multiple ISPs and multiple data centers. So we don't do any like the DNS, load balancing, or that stuff. BGP, I, I believe, is way better. Um, it means that we don't have to rely on DNS timeouts or anything like that to do failover. We can just, un, you know, BGP handles finding the best path to a certain IP. So if we are broadcasting BGP in multiple data centers, your travel will go to the closest data center. And then if we're having problems with an ISP or something like that, you can, BGP will kind of route around it pretty much automatically. So our, our routers, you know, broadcast our BGP stuff. And then we use Pingdom as a monitoring service and a bunch of kind of globally distributed servers that we set up to just monitor this ourselves. So BGP is great. It, it does kind of automatic unbalancing. It's not always that quick, though. And sometimes when failures are partial, like if an ISP is having a partial outage or just really high latency, BGP may not fully unbalance it. And so we do kind of our own monitoring to know, to try to figure out like, oh, this ISP is having problems. Let's yank it manually out of BGP so that traffic doesn't flow over it. So BGP handles most stuff automatically, but we also kind of use the hammer to pull out things when we need to. So that's traffic coming to us. So now we have, we have to make tons of outbound calls ourselves. So we, you know, you send us a credit card number, we're not the end user of that, right? We have to get that to the processing networks, to the banks. So for the people that know payments, I'm talking about like Chase Payment Tech, TSYS, First Data. Um, internationally, we connect directly to a lot of banks. So we need to basically run that card all the way back to the issuing bank to know whether or not the card is good and whether or not there's enough money on the card to actually do the purchase that the merchant wants. So we make outbound calls for this all, all the time. And like I said, we connect to tons of these networks. Um, based on, it's pretty complicated how we do it, but based on the card and then how the merchant account is set up, you know, whether we set up your merchant account or whether you came in from another provider, we basically route to different processing networks. Um, and like I said, ISP outages are generally partial. So you can't just say, like, we're going to take one ISP and connect all of our processing networks on that, or the other IP and connect all of them on that. So we've gotten into cases where we'll have multiple ISPs, and some of them can reach some of our processing networks, and some can reach other ones. And there's no one ISP that is golden, that we can't just say, say turn off the other ISPs, we'll use this one. And so what we wanted was a way to basically route to an, an end network via a specific IP. So even if all of our ISPs are having partial outages, we can still try to route around them as best we can. And so for that, we built something called processor proxies. So instead of connecting directly, instead of our, our app code connecting to an endpoint directly, we connect through a proxy. We run one proxy per TCP endpoint and uplink ISP. And then we load balance over them internally. So if we have pro problems, we can basically unbalance them. And so, right, so, you know, we have, if one ISP is totally out, well, all of those will unbalance. But if one IP is having partial outages, maybe only a few of the endpoints unbalance. And so the piece we built to do this, the process proxies, is called Mallory. It's also Python Tornado for the, a lot of the same reasons. It's basically just shoveling network traffic back and forth. We want it to be very efficient. Like I said, it proxies requests. So this is a good one. So, you know, we looked around, before we built our own proxy, we looked around a lot to try to find an existing one. And it turns out that most proxies don't do SSL verification. It's actually pretty unusual. Um, and if you look online, it's really unfortunate. Most, you know, advice online just says, just turn off SSL verification if you're doing certain things. So SSL gives us encryption, and you always have that. But one of the real benefits of SSL is, that, is the verification, is that you know who you're connecting to based on the certificates. And if you turn that off, you, you become susceptible to man-in-the-middles. And since we're processing payments, we don't want that to be a case. So we, our Mallory proxies actually verify the certificates of the endpoints that we're connecting to. 
And then the other cool thing with Mallory is it acts like litmus paper. So it has the same interface as litmus paper, which means that Big Brother can query it directly to get the health. And since it's also doing the proxying, it basically does the proxying and then keeps track of how it's going. And then when it gets queried for health, it says like, oh, the last few didn't really work, so I'm gonna return a lower health level. Or none of the last ones have been working, I'm gonna return a health level of zero. And so it can kind of do the proxying and kind of keep track of the health. This is also open source, so you can check it out on our GitHub. So here's what it looks like. Um, the dispatcher, you know, our app code makes, wants to call out to the processor. It uses a virtual IP that's load balanced. It hits that load balanced over multiple Mallory's. Each one is pinned to an ISP, and then eventually they all route it to the processor. So if ISP one is having issues, that Mallory unbalances and the traffic flows to the bottom one. So, you know, we do get connection failures, right? Like if the Mallory unbalances, the, the way we know to unbalance it is that we got a connection failure or we got a timeout or something like that. So connection failures are, you know, a reality in our line of work. So our, our, our general philosophy is let the service heal. So if you're connecting to an endpoint, you know, and you know you're get, you get an error, you just want to like let it heal. We know that we have this unbalancing in place. If it's something like the database or a load balancer, we know we have pacemaker, we know it'll do failover. And then we just retry. So we, we do a lot of retrying at many different levels of our stack. But the idea is, you know, when you go to call a processor, you get a connection error or you get a timeout, you just try again. And you know, and hopefully by then, the piece that had a problem is unbalanced or the database has failed over or something like that. And you, don't, you get an error again, you try again. And again, since we kind of control the timeouts, we can be careful at each step about how much time we have. So for example, if we can limit, let's say we limit our processor call to 10 seconds. You know, we're making a call across the world. It might take a little while. We limit 10 seconds. We open a connection, we get a timeout, we can try again, we can even try again, knowing that we've only consumed 30 seconds of our minute long request. And again, we, you know, we believe that it's better to return a 30 second request that's successful than a very short request that's unsuccessful. So generally people will tolerate, you know, you hit, you hit pay on a site, you'll generally tolerate kind of a long request there. Um, but what you, people won't tolerate is failure, right? If, you, if it says your credit card's invalid, you may just forget that purchase and move on and not actually do it. You, you know, the merchant may lose that. So we believe that we, it's better just to take a little bit longer and get the success. So yeah, that's pretty much it for that section. So to summarize, uh, we use load balancing for server failure. We have redundancy across ISPs, both inbound and outbound, inbound, BGP, outbound, these processor proxies. In general, we let the system heal and retry. So another thing, so another example of this are dispatchers, right? They're pulling off of the Redis queue. Before they pick up a request, they will heartbeat the app, which means they'll check the database and all that stuff. So if our database crashes, we obviously lose the stuff in flight. There's really nothing to be done about that. But before our dispatchers will pick up another request, they'll be doing heartbeats. So they won't pick up a new request until the database failover is complete and the database responds successfully. And then we'll pick up the next set of requests and keep going. So we try to minimize how many requests we lose, even for like a, our primary database failing. So the next section, the last section I have, is basically around people mistakes. So you know, we, all, we all know, lots of talks already have kind of talked about people kind of messing things up. Unfortunately, people are fallible, people make mistakes. People can cause outages, right? You run the wrong command or you do something stupid in production, you cause an outage. They can also exacerbate existing issues, right? Like let's say there's already an outage and you go to log in and you don't know what you're doing, you're, you run the wrong command, you do something stupid, you can make the outage longer or worse. Maybe you had a partial outage, now you have a full outage. So, you know, people can't, they don't just cause outages, they can also make things worse. So we try, so we try to basically, you know, try to solve for, not solve for them, because you can't solve for people's mistakes, we try to reduce the impact of this. So a couple examples, this is the big EC2 outage of 2011. Um, you know, they said the traffic shift was executed incorrectly. So, you know, someone there ran the wrong thing or made some kind of mistake. Um, the GitHub outage from 2010. This one, they accidentally dropped their production database when they meant to drop their test database. So, someone just ran the wrong command in the wrong environment and then they wound up having, I think they had to restore from a backup and they were down for a good chunk of the day. Uh, PagerDuty had an outage this year. They actually, this one's actually really interesting. They call out, you know, due to the engineers being extremely tired and burned out after working through the night on the upgrades. So, you know, once you, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with issues and you're up all night and you're super tired, you got woken up at 3 a.m., you're more likely to make mistakes. That's just kind of the reality of it. And I, and I don't mean to call out these companies. I think it's really great that they're so transparent that they post postmortems that we can all learn from. 
you know, my, my point here is that everyone makes mistakes. Every organization makes mistakes. We certainly have made mistakes. So you know, we, we just want to try to try to reduce it. So yeah, we, we do our best to reduce the people factor. So the first thing we kind of do on this front is we believe heavily in automation. We automate everything or nearly everything. So automation you know, does a great job of reducing errors. You know, if, you're, if you're running automated tasks, you don't have to worry about running the right co command line flags or running the, the wrong, you know, running the commands in the wrong order or something like that. You, if you rely on the automation, it's gonna run the right tasks in the right order most of the time. The other thing is, you know, automation gives you confidence that things work over time. So Braintree is a fast-moving organization. Things change, our infrastructure changes. The, the commands you ran a month ago may not be the same commands you run today. You know, the way you unbalance a service a month ago may not be the same thing you need to do now. Maybe the load balancers changed, maybe they upgraded, maybe things changed around. But if you rely on automation, then you have confidence that if something changes, the automation will also change. So you can rely on the task knowing that if you run the unbalanced task, the unbalanced task will do whatever it needs to to unbalance, regardless of what those commands are. And if those commands have changed over time, the unbalanced task will change with it. So you don't have this thing where you're running out of date commands, you're running the wrong commands. Automation just also speeds things up dramatically. You know, if you, if you have built in tasks for this stuff, you know, one, you're not going to Google to remember or running man to try to figure out what exactly you're supposed to run. Um, for us, we have these proxy deploys where we have, like I said, 30 seconds to do everything we need to do. You know, we've done things like database failover, we've done data center failover. You know, there's a lot of steps we need to do for those. We can never run those commands fast enough manually. So by relying on automation, you know, automation runs tasks as fast as a computer can run them. And it just accomplishes these things much faster. You know, if you're, already, if you're down and you're trying to bring things back up, running an unbalanced task will be much faster than trying to log into the server and run the commands yourself. And then in general, right, the more automation you have, the less fiddling around you do in production, and the less, the less time you spend in production, the less chance you're gonna make a mistake and cause some kind of problem. So the tools we use for this are Capistrano and Puppet. So we use Puppet for server configuration. Um, so all of our servers are created through Puppet. All the configuration is the same. They're all in a known state. You kind of, Puppet ensures that everything is basically in a known state, and it's all in configuration management and version control and all that stuff. And then we drive all of the tasks through Capistrano. So Capistrano does all the orchestration, it does the code deploys, it, you know, we have tasks to do unbalancing, tasks to do database failover, pretty much everything. So we drive everything through Capistrano, pretty much. And Capistrano, for those that don't know, is, it's, it's a Ruby language, it's kind of like Rake, but it basically at the end of the day runs system, like just shell commands essentially. So it automates running shell commands on many servers at once. And it has the idea, it has some other nice stuff like the idea of roles, so you could say, run this task on the app roles, run this task on the database roles, and it kind of knows how they're segmented. So we use Capistrano pretty heavily for that stuff. So besides the automation, we also had lots of safeguards to our, to our systems. So one of the big ones is dangerous tasks don't run in production. So the GitHub issue where they accidentally drop their database in production, if you run the task that drops our database, it won't run in production. It will say, there's a line of code that says, don't run unless my environment is QA or is test. So if you tried to run that command accidentally, it would blow up and saying, you can't run this in this environment. And we do this with other kind of dangerous tasks. We just don't, we just don't let them be run at all in production. We also add the environment name to our like, command line prompt. So in red, you know, next to where your dollar sign is saying your next command, it says production in a bright red text. So, and each environment has its own name. So you know if you're about to run a command, you know you're running it in production, or you know you're running it in a test environment. And it's right there on the line. You don't have to like, go check anything. You know, you know where you're running it, and it just makes it less likely you're on the wrong thing. And then we do things like read-only databases and logs. So if you need to query something, you need to look it up, you need to check the logs. You don't have to worry about accidentally deleting data or accidentally deleting some logs. You're connecting only to read-only versions of that stuff. And, and for the database, you're connecting to asynchronous slaves and another data center. So even if you ran a super expensive query and it brought down the database somehow, it doesn't affect production. You're only querying off slaves. Um, for logs, same thing. You're querying off a log server that's not the same as the production server. So you just don't have to worry when you're looking at stuff. So if you run an expensive graph, let's say you're trying to look at something and it spikes your disk IOs, you don't have to worry about that affecting production because it's not running on a production server. It's running on a separate server that's only doing logs. And then the last thing is monitoring. So we have, we have tons of monitoring to help us know when things are going wrong. 
and, uh, and just to kind of keep an eye on while you're doing known tasks in production. So we rely pretty heavily on Nagios. We use, um, we, we write tons of checks. So Nagios comes with all the built-in ones, you know, loads too high, server's not up, et cetera, et cetera. We also write tons of custom checks, like our nightly settlement job didn't finish, or our nightly recurring billing job missed some stuff because of some bug. So we, we rely pretty heavily on this. We have it hooked up to PagerDuty. So if a Nagios check goes off, depending on the severity of the Nagios check, it will call the person on call. If you are currently working in production, like you're doing a deploy or something, you'll have Nagios open, and then you'll set PagerDuty to be yourself. So if you make a mistake or you do something, you immediately get a phone call. You know you're right there. You can go fix it. You know immediately. There's no, you know, they try to reduce the lag there. And then we also built a multi-app log tail uh, with sampling. So if you're doing something in production and you want to you wanna know that you haven't affected anything, you can tail the logs across multiple apps. And we added things like coloring. So the, the log will stream with the color of the HTTP request. So 200s are you know, green, 500s are red. We also color it by time. So if things are succeeding but they're taking too long, they'll color, I think, yellow or orange. So you can basically, while you're working in production, you have this log tail going. Um, and we had to add sampling because the volume of logs is just too high to actually watch all of it. So you can say, I'm going to watch you know, the Gateway app and maybe these other two apps that I'm working on, and I want to only look at 3% of the logs. And then you can see them in color. And then if you know if you run something and all of a sudden you see red or you see the request times go way up, you know you did something, and you can immediately go and try to figure out and fix it. You don't, have to wait. You don't even have to wait for Nagios or PageDuty to go off. You know because you're watching the logs. So we, we also use like Tmux, and we generally do our work uh, split vertically, logs on one side and kind of the work you're doing on the other. And that way you have a visual. And since it's all colored, you just kind of keep it in the corner of your eye. And all of a sudden, if you see the color change, it kind of triggers something, and you look over, and you know that you need to fix something. And then we use Graphite and Munin to do graphing. Um, historically, we use Munin. We're kind of moving everything over to Graphite. And these, we don't really have hooked up to alerting, but they're more like you can kind of watch trends. So if you see the requests suddenly start taking too long, or maybe you start looking at the log, and you realize they're kind of high, but you don't know if it's something you did just now or if it's just been that way. You kind of go look at the graphs, and you can see what are the request times normally like? Is this normal for this route? Is it normal for this app? And you can kind of see the trending um, and know whether or not it's something you affected or something, someone, you know, just the way things are. So we rely pretty heavily on kind of visualization as well. We have dashboards with all these graphs and stuff like that kind of around the office. That's pretty much it. So to summarize people, right, we, we rely on automation, you know, very heavily. As much as we can, we automate. Uh, we also have safeguards to prevent people from just running the wrong thing in the wrong place. And then we do extensive monitoring to know that even if you did something wrong, that you, know, you can catch it very quickly and try to fix it. And that's it. Do you have uh, other questions? Yeah. OK. Uh, so the question is, what version of Capistrano are we using, and are we vulnerable to some shell expansion problem? So I don't know offhand what version. I think we're using 2.6, 2519, according to Dave. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that problem. I don't think we've run into that or even seen it. So I'm, I, maybe we talk afterwards. I'm not familiar with that expansion. I haven't seen it. We are not using Rails 4. Yeah, so the, the next question is having something check Graphite to do trend alerting. Um, we have, we're currently looking into this. There's a lot of things you can use. Um, Kale is one that we've been looking into that kind of watch trends and alerts on them. There's another thing called, um, that Heroku released called, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it also will, it basically turns a Graphite graph into a binary yes or no based on some arguments, and then you can put, ping, you know, Pingdom behind it. So Pingdom will say, like, if this, once it's a binary, you can say, like, if it's a binary false, you alert. Um, so we are looking into these things. We don't currently alert on that. For things that we want alerting, we just write Nagios checks that know the thresholds and, you know, basically alert on that. So we don't alert on, like, 70th percentile. We'll alert on, like, if this is more than three seconds. Any other questions? Yeah.
Yeah, so the, the question is why Redis for holding the connections? Um, at the time, we just kind of, you know, we thought about our options and we kind of evaluated, and we liked the idea of a queue because um, it's easy to pull things off a queue and you can kind of scale up and down very quickly. So if we have the proxy feeding into one queue and all of a sudden we realize we need more capacity, we can just very quickly spin up new app servers just pointing at the same queue. Um, and so then they just, they can flush the queue out, we can shut them down. We, you know, we have pools of app servers feeding off these queues, and we don't have to worry about how many things there are. We basically can spin them up and down and get kind of elasticity there a little bit easier. If we had more of a push model, which is something we have considered moving to, then we'd have to kind of set it up through the load balancing. That way, we, and then when we added or removed servers, we'd have to kind of adjust our load balancing, which is a little bit more of an operation, you know, because it affects the load balances, which are a little bit more dangerous. So things where we have great volatility, which is like our app spikes. You know, we have merchants that will do these crazy, like daily deal sites are a good example. We have these daily deal site merchants that will do these crazy deals, but only for one day. Well, they'll sell, you know, like Living Social is a good example. They sold Starbucks and Amazon, and they sold millions of these daily deals in one day. So for these days, we could very easily add more dispatchers to get more capacity, and then when the day is done, we just shut down those dispatchers. We don't have to worry about adding anything to load balancers or anything like that. Where? Oh, so the question is where do we terminate SSL? We terminate it at Apache. So Apache terminates SSL and then it passes the unencrypted request to the proxy and then from there on it's unencrypted. We, um, as a fo I don't know if quite what you're getting at, but as a follow-up, we run our own data centers, so we kind of control the entire environment. We're, we control our own PCI compliance, which is the payment compliance thing. And since it's all internal to our data center, we kind of, we have the freedom to kind of pass around unencrypted data internally if we like. And we do a lot of like network segmentation, so you can't just start up a new server on our network and listen to everything. We have, like, our servers aren't on the internet. Most of them aren't on the internet. Um, and then we kind of segment our network traffic. So we do have unencrypted traffic flowing through, but it's flowing through a, a very, you know, segmented area of our application. Yeah? Did you have more than one data center? We do. We currently have two data centers, and then we use BGP to kind of route the traffic around. So the question is, why do, if we have more than one data center, why don't we fail between them? So uh, we, we, our data centers right now are more of like an active-passive. We're currently working on more of an active-active, so we can actually have traffic going into both data centers simultaneously and easily unbalance. Right now, because it's active-passive, the failover between data centers is a pretty heavy operation, especially when you talk about like Postgres, because we basically need to, you know, we, we can't have a synchronous slave across between data centers. So we have asynchronous. So we need to basically shut down Postgres in one, make sure it's good in the other, it's basically just kind of a heavier operation and that we, we just, we try to do, you know, essentially the least risky thing. And so we feel like we have, we have the second data center if, some, if our main data center just goes, you know, just crashes. And we have multiple ISPs even into both data centers, so we are redundant there. But in general, if we don't have to do a full data center failover, we prefer just to keep things within a data center to reduce risk. Yeah. The log, so the question is how do we collect logs, essentially? Uh, we use, for most of it, we use syslog. So um, all of our servers run syslog and they just ship the logs to, they, they all ship to a log server in the production environment and then from there we then ship them again to another server outside the production environment. So we have a couple different places with the logs and then the one that's outside the production environment is the one that we actually do most of the querying on. Other questions, yeah. The question is, uh, what kind of virtualization do we use? We use Zen primarily. So we run our own data centers. We primarily use Zen servers. And then we have all that stuff is in Puppet as well. So we could spin up new Zen servers with Puppet. So you just add like the server configuration to Puppet, and then you Puppet the, the supervisor, and then it will create the virtualized server with all the right IPs and everything, and it kind of comes up. Um, for some of our beefier stuff, like the database boxes, those just run on bare metal. They're not virtualized. Other questions? All right, well, there's lots of swag up front if you want to grab shirts and cards and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, that's all I got.